Amen. Amen. Uh, about a month or so ago, I did, started a study that I was going to do. I kind of lined out the whole gospel of John. Well, not the whole gospel. I was getting there, but lining out people who had encounters with Jesus and then looking at what those encounters look like and then kind of see how does this line up with what the Lord might want to speak and minister to my own heart. The last time we met, we were looking there in, in the gospel of John chapter 2. We were looking at some people. We don't even know their names. They were just simply called servants, and I love that because because again, there might be people sitting next to you right now and, and nobody knows who you are. Nobody knows your name. But God knows your name and he cares about you. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. He wants to reveal that to you. But we also saw there in, in John chapter 2 that Jesus was an invited guest. And if we want to have an encounter with Jesus, we need to open our hearts and we need to invite him in. He's a gentleman. He's not going to go where he's not invited. And yet, if we want him to be a part of our lives, then we need to open our hearts. We need to invite him. We also saw there in, in John chapter 2 that Mary told the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And that we watched how these servants walking in obedience to what God had asked, they got to see the miraculous. And the same thing happens with you and with me. When we walk in obedience to what God is asking us to do, we get to experience the miraculous. We get to see, in a sense, the water turning into wine and God taking and using our lives. But this morning, we're going to come to John chapter 3, and we're really going to be looking at um, what I would say is a radically familiar portion of Scripture. But instead of really doing a kind of an in-depth verse-by-verse study, we're going to really more so be honing in and looking at a man by the name of Nicodemus. And again, I could just read these verses. I remember one pastor uh, talking about, you know, uh, he said, that dog can hunt. In a sense, he was talking about a portion of Scripture that all you need to do is basically read it, and it'll do the work that God intends it to do. But this morning, we're going to be looking at this, but we're going to be looking at this man named Nicodemus and, and his encounter with Jesus Christ, and then kind of see what the Lord might speak and minister to our hearts through this encounter with Jesus. The Gospel of John, chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, it tells us that he was a Pharisee, which meant that he served in the great Sanhedrin, which was kind of like the Jewish Supreme Court. It was made up of 71 members. Um, their job and responsibility was to interpret the, the civil as well as the religious laws for the nation of Israel. It was made up of both a people called a people group called the Pharisees as well as the Sadducees. Now, for the Sadducees, most all of them were priests, and and they were the you know supposed to be instructing the people in who God was, was and what God required. Now, the Pharisees, there were a lot of them that were priests, not all of them, but a lot of them were. But the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Pharisees believed in the literal word of God. The Pharisees believed in angels. They believed in the resurrection from the dead. They also believed that, that God was going to usher in uh, the Messiah, the one who was going to come and, in a sense, for the nation of Israel, in a sense, bring about world peace. Now, unfortunately, the Sadducees, even though they were the priests and they should have known who God was and should have believed in angels, should have believed in the resurrection, should have believed in the Messiah, unfortunately, they didn't. And that's why oftentimes they say they were sad, you see. But again, as it comes to Nicodemus, okay, as it comes to Nicodemus, uh, he, uh, we don't really know a whole lot about Nicodemus other than um, the things we read here, I found it fascinating that I was doing some reading and there were some Jewish writings talking about a man who lived at the time of Christ, was a part of the Sanhedrin, whose name was Nicodemus. And it was said of, and whether this is the same one or not, we don't know, could be. But it was said of him that he was so wealthy that his wealth alone could sustain the city of Jerusalem for 10 years just by himself. But again, whether this was or wasn't, we don't know. But, but what we do know is, the priests were called, the priests were um, required by God to communicate to the people who God was and what God required of them. And, and again, God desires that we know him. God desires that we have an understanding of, of who he is and what he requires from us, that we might enjoy time 
with him. That's what God is all about. But what I find interesting, and again, I'm going to do kind of a little commercial on the priests, go back and do a little history about them. When the nation of Israel, they were in uh, Egypt in bondage, uh, some 400 years or so that they were in bondage in Egypt. Um, the people cry out to God. God sends this man, Moses. He comes in, tells Pharaoh, let my people go. And in the process of Pharaoh letting the people go, the, his heart kept getting harder and harder. And finally, he does all of these plagues, these 10 plagues. But when it gets to the very last plague, the last plague was, uh, it, it was the death of the firstborn. And yet what God did at this time was he instituted the Passover. He had the Jews grab the little lamb. They brought it into their house. They killed the lamb at twilight. They took the blood. They took the blood of the lamb and they put it upon the door uh, of their house. And that night, the angel of death went throughout all the land of Egypt. And where he saw the blood on the doorpost, the angel of death passed over. That house did not experience death within their house. But anywhere the angel went over and he did not see the blood on the doorpost, that house experienced death, the death of the firstborn. And in a sense, isn't that what Jesus Christ has done for you and me? In fact, we're going to read about that today, how he was God's Passover lamb. His blood was spilled. And if we apply the blood of Jesus on the doorpost of our hearts, if we believe that God, this is God's gift that he sent, that he came to save mankind, and if his blood is applied to the doorpost of our hearts, when the angel of death passes over us, we will not experience that death. But if the blood of Jesus is not applied to the doorpost of our hearts, then we will experience death. We will experience eternal separation from the Father for all eternity. But God sent his son that we might not experience that. And yet what I find interesting is God was um, setting up this last little plague, the, the plague of the death of the firstborn. Um, after that, in Exodus 13, God says this to Moses. He says, consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast is mine. The Lord chose the firstborn, the firstborn male within each and every family, in a sense, to be consecrated to him, to be a representative of, of him, to be a part of the family, to communicate who God is and what God's all about and what God requires. And what I love about that is, is that God has not changed. He still desires that each one, each family would have a representative of who he is. Doesn't the Bible say that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, husband, wife, man, woman, whoever you are, whatever is going on, God wants to use your life to communicate who he is within your home. He hasn't changed. And yet for the, the children of Israel, God picked the, the, in a sense, the firstborn male to be consecrated to himself, that he would have a representative in each and every family. But then something happened as we move from Exodus 13 uh, and we get down to Exodus 32. It's the story where Moses goes up on the mountain. He's going to receive the Ten Commandments, but he's up there. He's delaying so long, and uh, the people think that he died. And uh, they come to Aaron, Moses' brother, who was left in charge, and said, Hey, you know, Moses, we don't know what happened to him. Give us a God. And so they says they took their earrings off and they threw them in a pot. And as Aaron was trying to explain to Moses how this happened, and out jumped this golden calf. He, he made a golden calf and then they worshiped that golden calf. And they said, this is the God that delivered you from the nation of, of Egypt. And then Moses comes down the hill. The people decide to, to do this perverted, yucky party that went on and on, as Moses comes down the hill, he's looking around and he's saying, man, who is on the Lord's side? Now, the tribe of Levi was not participating in their little perverted party. They were standing off to the side. And the Bible says that the tribe of Ebi stood up and they came and God used them to bring about his judgment for the children that were doing these things. And yet after that, in Numbers 3, the Lord says, now behold, I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of every firstborn who opens a womb among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine because all the firstborn 
our mind. So at that point, then God chooses this tribe of Levi, in a sense, to be his priests, his representatives, uh, instead of the firstborn. But what I love about this and why this story, why this history, is that when they come into the land, again, every one of the, the, the sons of Israel were given portions throughout the land. They were given land, except for the tribe of Levi, because the Lord told them that he was going to be their inheritance when they entered in to the land. And then God brought them into the land and then he took and scattered them throughout the land. He gave them 48 cities in a sense of to have his people scattered throughout that they might represent him to the whole nation. They were north, south, east, and west. They were scattered in 48 cities to again communicate who God was was. And I just love that. Again, why? Because God is desired to be known. And he wants us to make him known, and he wants us to make him known to others. What I find fascinating is by the time we get to 2 Kings chapter 17, it's this cool little story in there uh, about the, the Assyrians. They had come down and conquered the northern tribe. And when the Assyrians came and conquered, what they did was they took a people group from here, picked them up, moved them to another area, and put them over there and took a People group from over there moved them over here. Well, they had conquered the northern tribe, and they took the northern people, and they picked them up, and they moved them way out over here. Then they took another group, people group and put them in the land of Israel. But those people did not know the Lord. They did not understand his ways. They did not understand what it was that he was requiring of them. And it says that the Bible says that the God sent lions out among the people and began to kill the people. So the people began crying out to the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria goes back to the, to the Jews that he had moved away and say, hey, are there any priests who'd be willing to go back to Israel and explain to the people who God is and what he likes and, and what he doesn't like so that they wouldn't be a fence? And I just crack up because I you know, imagine these people like, if you were a priest, sure, I'll go back to, to Israel and tell people about who God is. What I find fascinating is that here you have a heathen king doing that, and yet here we have a nation that's not heathen, not supposed to be heathen, and yet we're not even willing to do that ourselves. But here with Nicodemus, we see this man here in the Gospel of John. Again, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do the things you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. Again, more likely than not, he doesn't want anyone to see that he's coming to Jesus. It would kind of be like he's a part of the Supreme Court there. He is looked at as a very important person. It's kind of like if a Supreme Court justice came in and sat among us, it'd be kind of like this little buzz. Hey, do you know there's a Supreme Court? I mean, someone who held a high place in society, and yet he didn't want other people to know that he was interested or that he was seeking out counsel or, or instruction from Jesus. It, it's kind of like he was the secret service Christian, you know? And you guys know those kind of people? They're like secret service Christian. They're like Christian, but I'm not going to tell anyone. Don't tell everyone that, that I'm, I'm a Christian, something like this. Can I say something? If, if you've been living in a house or you've been at a job for 5, 10, 15, 20 years... And the people at your job, the people that are around you, your neighbors, they don't know you're a Christian. Hey, there's something wrong with your Christianity. Because Jesus says that we are to so let your light so shine that others may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. He says, you know what? We've been given a light, and you don't take that light and put it you know, in a place where it's, you can't see it. But a light is meant to be put on a hill so that it would shine forth. Again, I remember when I was working in used to do a lot of construction, and we were working up in L.A., and, and uh, there was a guy on the job who was a foreman for this company we were working for, and they'd worked with him for a couple years, and this guy just had the foulest mouth and just a, one of the meanest dudes I'd ever met. And I remember one time, and it was, you know, a couple, you know, we had been interacting with him, and I was running jobs for my brother for a few years, and uh, I remember coming on a job, and everyone knew I was a Christian. I mean, I had a Volkswagen bus. I painted Jesus Loves You on the top, and I used to drive it and park it. Just, hey, I want people to know, you know. I love Jesus, you know. <laughs> but, but I remember coming in one night, and, and he had said, hey, where you been? I said, oh, I was at Bible study. We were doing a grocery store, so we were working late at night. And, and uh, he says, oh, yeah, really? Okay. He goes, you know, I go to Bible study, too, and I'm trying to pick my job off the ground. I'm looking at this guy like, you got to be kidding. I've only heard 
word, four-letter words come out of your mouth, and, and none of it's healthy, none of it's good. If that's the kind of Christian you are, um, take a serious look at your walk and where you're at in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because you're not letting your light so shine. And if you're something different at work, if you're something different at home rather than what you are here, if you're sitting here and just, you know, being all pious and yet you walk out the door and you're cussing up and down and, and cheating and lying and stealing and doing all this, hey, 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 um, I'm not sure that you're really saved. I'm not sure that you really are a Christian. So check that out. <laughs> Amen. Amen. What I'm trying to say, don't be a secret service Christian, okay? You know what? Let your light shine. But you know what? Here's the thing with Nicodemus. He sees something very different about Jesus. He sees something very different about Jesus. This man does things that no other man can do. And yet his only conclusion is, is that God is with him. God is with this guy. Nicodemus encountered somebody who was unlike anyone he had ever encountered before. Someone who spoke unlike anyone he had ever heard before. Someone who acted unlike anyone he had ever seen before. And yet Nicodemus came to the conclusion was that God is with this guy. And yet Jesus, I love this because Jesus is going to answer a question that is never really asked. You know, the question you think is going to be asked is, man, how are you able to do this? What's so different? Uh, what makes you so different knowing that, that God is with you? And yet what I believe the real question was going on in Nicodemus's heart is a question that I sometimes find within my own heart and sometimes in the hearts of others. Nicodemus's real question is, what is it that I'm missing? When I look at the life of Jesus Christ and I see him, I see how he talks, I see how he acts, I see the things that he does, what is it that's missing in my own heart and my own life? Because again, remember Nicodemus, he was like, the pastor. And yet as he has this encounter with Jesus Christ, he realizes, hey, there's something missing. Hey, he could have been a, the, the, the Sunday school worker, an usher, a greeter, you know, helping out. And yet he realized within his heart there was something that is missing. Maybe today as you're sitting here, you're thinking, you know what? Within my life, might there be something that's missing? Something that there's a little disconnect when it has to do with who God is and what he wants of me. And yet what I find fascinating as we continue to read on, Jesus again answers a question that was never asked. And Jesus said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's like Nicodemus saying, man, what is it that I'm missing? What do I need to do to experience God? Um, and yet he wanted to experience not the God that he saw in the religious circles he was hanging out with. Because he saw people, and he saw the hypocritical actions and all this. He saw something different in Jesus. And it's like, what is it that I'm missing? Because I want to experience the God that you serve, the God that you are involved with. And yet Jesus' response to him would be the same response to you and me. Hey, people, we must be born again. We must be born again. You know, and oftentimes you say things like that, and people like in their minds, they immediately go to, okay, what hoop is it that I need to do to jump through that, you know, I'll be okay with God? What hoop do I need to do, you know, that I can, it's kind of like, how far can I sin and yet still be saved? You know, and if you're asking yourself questions like that, I'm going to say, hmm, are you really saved? If you're more concerned with about how much sin you can get away with, rather than how close you can be to Jesus Christ. And yet, Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and Jesus looks at him and says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. To which Nicodemus, in trying to comprehend, trying to understand, he, he looks at Jesus in verse 4 and says, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And yet when Jesus looks at Nicodemus, when he says you must be born again, the word he uses for born is to procreate, to beget, to conceive, to be born. All speaking of the birthing process of bringing forth new life. It's all speaking of that. Yesterday, me and my wife went by and we dropped off a meal for a couple who had their very first baby and it was only five days old and it was only like five pounds. So it was just this little, little guy, Mateo, there. And as she was holding them there, little Mateo, she kept saying, man, I can't believe this was inside of me. I can't believe this was inside of me. And again, I love that. The whole birthing process and the miraculous gift of life that God gives to each and every one of us. And yet Nicodemus is scratching his head and like, okay, I I'm not quite getting this, Jesus. I'm not quite getting it. So Jesus goes on to explain. There in verse 5, Jesus answered, 
Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. Nicodemus, you've had a fleshly birth. You have been born once. And yet that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Nicodemus, what you're missing is is to be born of the Spirit. Do not marvel, he goes on to say, that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus tells Nicodemus, the birthing process I'm speaking of is is not that of the flesh, but it's that of the Spirit. If you want to experience the kingdom of God, if you want to encounter with God, it does not happen in the realm of the flesh. You cannot make that happen. It happens in the realm of the Spirit. And Nicodemus saw something different in Jesus. He saw an encounter, that the, the, the Spirit of God moving and working in Jesus' life that he didn't see in his own life. And yet he knew that it was missing, but Nicodemus really in one sense could not connect The dots. So he responds in verse 9. Nicodemus Nicodemus answers and said to him, How can these things be? And yet I love Nicodemus' honesty uh, here. He doesn't do what we oftentimes do and say, Okay, I get it. It's all about the Spirit. I must be born again when we really don't have a clue of what is going on and we're just kind of shaking our heads. And yet Nicodemus desires and wants to have a real encounter with God. He desires and wants to know who this God is. And yet this encounter with Jesus Christ brought him face to face with the reality that he's missing something, that he's missing something. It brought him face to face with God. And people, when we have an encounter with Jesus, it will bring us face to face with the reality that there is a need within our lives a need that only Jesus Christ can fulfill, a need that no human understanding can comprehend, a need that brings us to the end of ourselves and face to face with a God who loves us, who gave his son to die on a cross for us and who desires to have an experience with each and every one of us. And yet at this point, all Nicodemus can do is to be open and honest, which is something that I love and something God wants of each and every one of us. Will you be open and honest with the Lord? And yet Nicodemus says, how can these things be? And yet now we're going to come upon a portion of Scripture that, you know, again, it's some of the most quoted verses in the Bible of trying to get Nicodemus to understand this concept. And yet he says, Nicodemus says to him, are you a teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? He says, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, The Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And I love this, because Jesus takes Nicodemus, who, as a teacher of Israel, he knew and he taught the people the spiritual truths contained in the Word of God. Jesus Jesus brings him to a story in the Bible to illustrate the spiritual truths of who he is And what he is about to do. As Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, he takes him to a story in Numbers 21 there. And the story is where they're wandering in the wilderness. And it says the soul of the people became discouraged on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food, no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. And the people became discouraged and began complaining of everything going on within their lives. And they began to blame God. I mean, God had provided this man of the man of little wafers and honey. I mean, it's just like this incredible thing that God provided every single morning. God provided the water. He took care of their needs while for 40 years while they're traveling out there, out and about. And yet they begin complaining about all that God had provided for them. So the Lord sent some fiery serpents among the people. They bit the people, and the people died that were bit. 
The people cry out to Moses. Moses cries out to God. And then the Lord tells Moses to make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent. He put it on a pole. So it was if a serpent had bitten anyone. When he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So Moses goes. He takes this this brass pole and he puts this brass serpent upon the pole. And he goes up and he sets it in the middle of the camp. And anyone who was bit by one of these snakes, if they looked at this thing, they lived. If they didn't look at this snake, they died. You know that same symbol is used on our ambulances and at the hospitals today. It's the pole and the little snake that's wrapped around it. You see that in the, in the medical field. And yet Jesus here is like, Nicodemus, you believe that I've come from God and I have to speak and to work for God. Yet Jesus says, you know what, I've come to unite heaven and earth. But there's a problem. And the problem is sin. Man has been bitten Or we have been born with a sin nature that separates us from a holy, righteous God. And yet the sin must be dealt with for us to enter into a relationship, for us to enter into an encounter with God. That that sin issue must be, needs to be dealt with. And yet Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, I am the one that's come. I am going to be that bronze serpent that if anyone who has been bitten by the the world of sin, and the Bible tells us we each and every one of us has, if he would but look to this serpent on the pole, he shall experience life. He shall experience eternal life. And as Jesus goes on, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son of the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And again, I love that as Pastor Jeff was sharing last week. There is now, no, there, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. God didn't come to condemn us. He didn't come to condemn us. He came to save us from this world, which is and has condemned us to eternal separation from the Father. That's why Jesus Christ came, that we would not experience that death, but we would experience the life he has for us. As Jesus continues on, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into into the world, and yet men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Nicodemus, I have come to connect heaven and earth. I have come so that mankind who is separated from a holy, righteous God might be able to experience an encounter with Jesus Christ. I have come to remove the the death of the serpent who has bitten all mankind. I have come so that you would no longer walk in darkness, but you could now walk in light. I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. Nicodemus knew there was something that was missing within his life. He had jumped through all of those religious hoops, and yet, in a sense, he came up short. And our best works, the Bible says, we will always come up short. And yet, Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must have a spiritual birth in your life, and to receive that spiritual birth, you have to believe in me. You must believe in Jesus Christ as the means by which, and the only means by which you can be saved. But again, God gives us a choice, just as Jesus gives Nicodemus a choice here. He is not going to make us do something we don't want to do. He gives us a choice of light and life or darkness and death, but we get to choose. You know, people, maybe today, maybe this morning, you come and you find yourself in a place maybe like Nicodemus. Maybe you've jumped through all of the hoops and believe that you've done all the right things, and yet you realize within your heart there's something missing. Now, in one sense, when I read this story and look at this, we don't see Nicodemus' last words here saying, yeah, I get it. I'm with you, Jesus. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to believe in you. No, no, no. His last words is, how can these things be? And I believe in my heart that Nicodemus walked away still not believing, still not understanding, still not connecting the dots. 
But what I love about the story of Nicodemus, this is not the last place we find him in Scripture. In fact, we find him later on in the Gospel of John, chapter 19. And there it's at the cross of Jesus Christ we see Nicodemus. In fact, we see him and another man, a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, going to Pilate and asking for the body of Jesus. And yet it says that there was a man with him named Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus by night. And yet I believe that that encounter, when, when Nicodemus walks up and he sees Jesus hanging there on the cross, I believe at that moment he began to connect the dots. As Jesus had told him, just like the serpent would be lifted up, so the Son of Man would be lifted up, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I believe as Nicodemus saw that, he had an encounter with God that changed his eternal destiny. He had an encounter that would change his life forever because he saw God's only son lifted up, hanging on that cross, shedding his blood for the world, for him, and for each and every one of us, each and every one of us. The encounter of Jesus and Nicodemus, it brought Nicodemus face to face with a God that he realized, you know what, you have something that I don't. And Jesus says, yeah, but what I have, I want to freely give to each and every one who would open their hearts and receive it. This afternoon, Jesus Christ wants to offer you that gift of eternal life. Jesus wants to offer you the gift of, of the power of his Holy Spirit to empower you, to enable you, to do the things that he is called and asking of us to do. And yet he's wanting to know, will we receive? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and the things that are written here within your word. God, and I ask and pray, Lord, for each and every one that's here. Lord, as we read this story, as we see this life of Nicodemus and look at his encounter with you, God, in one sense, at this moment, he walked away, still confused, still not connecting the dots. But not long after that, he stood and he saw the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world hanging upon that cross. And that encounter changed his life forever. Father, if there are any here, Lord, who are in desperate need of you, God, would they open up their heart and would they allow you to speak and to minister? God, would you come and would you wash and would you cleanse of all unrighteousness, God? Would you fill by the power of your Holy Spirit? Lord, and again, we may be sitting here and we may be being used in ministry, and yet we know within our hearts there's something that is missing. And God, you want to do a spiritual birth within our hearts and lives. And Lord, that birth takes place by looking to you and, and, and understanding that it is not a work of the flesh. It is not a work of righteousness, what I do, but it's according to your mercy that you have saved me. You wash me and you cleanse me. Father, would you fill each and every one of us in here today by the power of your Holy Spirit. Give us your light. Give us your life. Lord, give us your spirit. Enable us, Lord, to shine forth your light, your love, and your grace in a world that is lost, dark, and dying. Use us, we ask and pray. And we do thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people agree by saying amen. amen.